I mean, great. Thanks. Welcome, everyone, to uh, our annual episode of uh, IoT and Tank Monitoring. Today, I'll be talking, my name is Anton Auburn, as Simon mentioned. Today, we'll be talking about modernizing logistics operations through IoT Tank Monitoring. And um, certainly had a wonderful experience last year. Wish we were all face-to-face -face in Houston uh, like last year, but hopefully, you know, by next year, it's, it's back in the saddle down there. So um, looking forward to at least uh, getting a chance to connect with everybody virtually. So thank you again. Um, see. So um, I'll start with uh, really what data and how data is the underlying uh, core function or, or component of any IoT solution. And it, start, it all starts with data. Um, in fact, um, they say that if you interrogate data long enough, it will eventually confess. So I think we've learned that and certainly some of the data applications that we've done in, in our niche market with tank monitoring and, and other components of the business. But that's a, a quote from uh, Ronald Co Coase from The Economist. I thought it was interesting. So you start with one byte or bit of data and then that turns into megabytes and kilobytes and uh, gigabytes and even terabytes and it's so much data layers and layers of data that really kind of compound on each other and trying to organize all that data is, is difficult. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, kind of your, your first component of an IoT solution and the value of data is the data collection piece. So um, that kind of starts at your bottom core. And then um, a level up from that is data integration, integrating data, um, interpreting data into your network. Um, into systems applications, um, your business partners, your ecosystem, and then ultimately data analytics. And um, what did Jeffrey Moore say? I believe it was um, without data analytics, companies are blind and deaf, essentially. Um, it's like walking out onto a dark web like a deer uh, in the freeway. So in other words, just sort of deaf and, and blind and dumb without having any sort of um, visibility or a way to take and manipulate that information into something more valuable. So I uh, thought that was an interesting quote. Ultimately, all of this, you know, this progress, you know, equates to ROI, return on investment, which is what we're all looking for in companies. Um, so this is sort of the stacking of that value and how this ultimately relates to that. So uh, just what is the value of IoT telemetry, essentially? Well, it's a certainty. It creates certainty through great predictions, which requires all of these elements below listed, um, which come through ultimately frequent and reliable data, which is what the core functionality of an IoT solution is. So a little bit about us, just kind of some background. Skybits, whoops, Skybits Amatech. Um, we uh, are an IoT division under Amatech and uh, Amatech is about a $5.2 billion company. Uh, the IoT component of that, um, which Skybus is a part of, is connects to about 1.5 million uh, devices. Um, so we have that many people and, and, and assets on our, sorry, I should, should say uh, assets on our network, but really it breaks down into three core component uh, product lines. You've got um, trailer and asset container tracking, which is unpowered asset tracking. Um, we've developed technology to support that. And really what that brings is a, is a capacity planning location services to support an efficient network, um, managing um, a lot of assets and a lot of inventory across, um, you know, a large geography or a complicated network uh, supply chain. Um, we'll also uh, we also handle petroleum chemical distribution applications, which are, you know, more, I'd say, fully integrated solutions, ERP, uh, invoicing, accounting integrations, but provide that um, very in-depth um, dispatch, uh, cash register, weights and measure. So it's, it's a very specific, um, you know, application to support those petroleum and chemical transport applications. And then I'll, today I'll be talking about tank monitoring. So 
if you look at the size of the these different product lines, the the trailer and trucking and transport is is probably you know sixty five percent of the business with tank monitoring being about you know their twenty twenty five position uh, you know twenty twenty five percent of the business, and then it grows into about the last ten percent. 15% into the petroleum chemical distribution. So that's kind of the breakdown. But when you look at the growth of the market, tank monitoring is growing at 33% um, year over year, and it's expected from Berg to, to continue on that trajectory. So certainly a, a large opportunity here. It's an, a very under-adopted marketplace at this time, uh, moving into that sort of early adoption phase. So everybody kind of knows the, um, you know, what it looks like from a, a closed loop system, uh, looking at an end-to-end -end cloud based solution for IoT. It all begins with, you know, purpose built hardware. So it's wireless, it's reliable, it's easy to install. You know, then you have your cloud connectivity. You have then the dissemination of that information into the modern hardware, or the, sorry, the modern software. So robust, you know, reporting, information, visibility, and then that can lead into even a higher level of data analytics. And then, of course, having a customer care component that ties it all together, make sure that operations are running smoothly, um, implementations and deployments, both complex and simple, uh, happen quickly and rapidly and efficiently, um, and also accurately. And then, obviously, ongoing strategic uh, account management beyond that. Um, so that's kind of the four pillars, three, if you will, um, that define what an end-to-end -end cloud based IoT solution is at its most basic level. So let's kind of start with what a tank monitor is and get down into it. Um, so really if you look at the left side there's a rendering here of a tank with some type of liquid in it and you've got the telemetry uplink device that's the communication layer. You've got a cable that runs down and then the sensor lies at the bottom of the tank. The reason why is because it actually uh, collects information um, through a diaphragm and it's a differential pressure. So it'll tell you from the weight and force that's pressed on that, um, what ultimately the level of the tank will be because the system will take that information, communicate it through a cellular or a terrestrial network. And we also offer satellite solutions as well. And that information then gets crunched and it ultimately comes into inches and gallons. And it lets you know, you know when you need to make a change. Um, so just high level on, on the, the tank monitor component, low cost, easy to install. I'd say less than 15 minutes to install these things. There are some um, you know, exceptions to that when you have higher tanks or more sophisticated um, setups. Battery operated, so we have intelligent pa power management that helps support um, you know, long battery life. Um, that, th that happens through wake up intervals that we preset and allows that uh, unit to almost act as a backup to a continuous monitoring situation and feel very confident that you're going to have reliable frequent data going back to that first slide. Extreme weather resistant, um, we're looking at uh, negative 30 on the cold side. So in the Rockies, top of the Rockies or the Alps, maybe um, you're looking at, you know, negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit, still going to operate. And even where I'm at, um, broadcasting live from Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's cooled off a little bit, but it's still um, a little bit, little bit on the warm side. It'll actually go up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, nice broad temperature range. Um, we oversee and, and tank monitoring oversees totes, verticals, all shapes and sizes. Um, and then of course, all the contents that come in it, which could include liquids, chemicals, caustics, um, of course, fuels, lubes, diesels. Um, and uh, we also offer uh, uh, hazmat or uh, intrinsically safe um, solutions as well. So let's look at a world real quickly without IoT tank monitor. What does that look like? How, how challenging is that? And, and I think it all starts with, let's break it down into the cost. So, you know, if you're looking at a 250 gallon tank, and this is pretty common in the industry, as many of you know already, um, that 250 gallon tank, there's a delivery cost associated with that delivery, no matter if it's 40% empty or 30% empty or 10% empty or 100 or 99% empty. Um, but ultimately, whatever gallons you're able to deliver to that tank become your cost per gallon delivery cost. So in this first scenario, uh, which is one of two I'll, I'll show you, um, you've only delivered 
100 gallons because it was only 40% empty, 60% full, that was 75%, 75 cents per gallon delivery cost. Now let's look at another example. Same 250 gallon tank, 75% um, empty, however. So all of a sudden you're delivering 188 gallons at a $75 cost per delivery. So you're looking at 40 cents now per delivery, per gallon delivery cost. So your savings there is substantial. Um, it's 35 cents per gallon just for those two tank examples. So, and that's pretty industry average. So if you are not using tank um, monitoring solutions uh, and you're going with a visible, these are just you know, some high level costs that can show you or justify that ROI. Now let's look at a long road traveled with no visibility into those tank levels. So um, this is a common milk run, which everybody knows. You've got um, multiple stops, usually have a route. But in this scenario, it's really, um, it's a mixed bag. You've got um, some, the first stop, you really didn't need to stop. It's a total top off, which is a waste of time and energy. Um, and then the next one, you probably did need to serve. It's at 75 or 70% 70 empty. Next one may be on the fence, but then you can see the rest of them. Um, they don't actually fill um, the gap where you actually have a retain at the end of the route. So now the truck is returning with 30% of its fuel, which means it has to go and for traceability purpose, restore that fuel into a compartment. This could be generator diesel, it could be bleach, could be whatever it is. But my point being is when you start the day full, you wanna end the day empty and that's, that's critical or have options to do that. In this scenario, you can't do it. So here's another map view of it, where a truck's going. This is a dispatcher view. So let's just look at the costs and the, the implications that come from not being able to have that visibility. Truck stops at the wrong one, it's green. It has no need to get refilled. So you're looking at 30% um, tank empty. Well, guess what? That created extra driver labor. He's not gonna be able to do the tanks that were really needed to be done excessive maintenance repairs because that truck's gonna to have to travel a lot further over its lifetime. Higher fuel consumption, longer routes, need for more trucks because you're gonna to have to have trucks to augment where you've been inefficient. Additional customer invoices. Every invoice creates another invoice and they cascade uh, and extrapolate, they tend to grow. So anything to do to eliminate that or limit that, I would say is, is, uh, is gonna be a cost saving. Lastly, truck depreciation. So expanding your service area with, you know, by delivering more gallons with fewer trucks is what we're proposing. So let's take that same example and let's put it into a highly de uh, efficient delivery network. Beginning of the day, generator of diesel on the truck and starting its route. This route has been pre-planned. The dispatcher knows which tanks to service. The driver is fully aware of the route and it's going through its motions and every one of these tanks is is, is in route and in line with those parameters to maximize that load. And like, guess what? On the right side of the screen, the truck is returning now uh, completely empty. So no need to go and restock fuel or store the retain. Much better scenario here. So just in summary, optimize routes, maximize driver and asset productivity, eliminate unnecessary costly stops, ultimately increase customer satisfaction with those timely deliveries and accurate deliveries, and then obviously maintain an accurate inventory, which is critical in the business. So let's talk about a few use cases here. Um, you know, you've got a manual way for calling customers. It's, it's, it's completely, you know, blind in terms of not being able to have visibility into um, inventory levels or tanks. So you're gonna get you know, manual stick readings, which are gonna be inaccurate. Well, with tank monitoring, you get rid of the manual errors. The two worst evils you could possibly have are runouts and false alarms that create extra work. Runouts, of course, you can lose business or customers or create problems, expenses. Um, that goes away with, with uh, tank monitors. Emergency deliveries, which happen all the time and many times are unnecessary, but there are some, you know, something sparks a, a sense of urgency and there's no way to refute it. So um, you may have to send a truck a hundred miles out to go do an emergency delivery when it really wasn't needed. And then POs can get held up for days or weeks. Um, that can cause additional delays, which could create runouts um, or lost customers. So auto alert, auto PO, and then auto invoice and reconciliation is what we're talking about here. 
Uh, also, the dispatcher has no visibility. In this situation, they can contact the customer. Hey, do you see what I see? They can see the screen. Yes, we're good. We'll do the, we'll do the delivery in a week or two once it's hit the, the threshold. Milk run customers. So we did the milk run a little bit ago, but topping off tanks on a recurring basis, you know, is just a, it's a huge waste of time. You're just running through the motion, delivering your cost per gallon goes way up. And so instead of that, you're doing dynamic needed demand driven deliveries. Um, typically only 40% uh, empty, and that's usually kind of the industry standard. Now it's filling tanks to 75% empty, much better. More deliveries versus less deliveries. Retains left on truck upon returning, no retains. Run, outs, run out of product before completing a route, um, completing all routes. So you're not getting stuck. I don't have enough product because I didn't plan accordingly because I didn't know. And then you have, of course, the excessive invoices. So now let's talk about a tank farm scenario, which is a little different than a milk run. Um, I know there's a stick figure here running up the side of the tank. There's no ladder and there's no stick, but I figured since it's a stick figure, it could just be included. Um, so anyway, uh, I think that the thing about tank farms is they're scattered, they're difficult to, to reach, they're tall. Um, they have many different types of products, you know, usually in them. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's a situation really where you don't see a lot of tank monitors in tank farms and, and that's changing quickly, but uh, low accuracy because you're sticking the tank manually, a lot of falling and safety issues. And then of course, the time consume uh, issue of actually having to climb up and service them. And then let's look at an optimized view with tank monitors. You get rid of all that stick figure goes away installed tank monitors and um, you're able to see and get readings right at the right at the uh, location site um, you eliminated the the need to climb the tanks uh, you can also set up a host client uh, a local area network solution where you have up to 32 clients per host which can communicate you know thus creating a, a cost savings in terms of communication and solution for uh, for a tank monitoring solution so um, one host is communicating data from all of these different constituent tanks next to it. So let's look at it through the lens of a logistics operations um, person that's, that's uh, actually in charge of looking at routes and tanks. This is one, you know, just one single tank that we're looking at right now, but you can see that, you know, it was filled, but it's starting to drop down. Um, alarms have been set here. It's, the status is still okay, which is great, but it's coming down. And, you know, the dispatchers and the, you know, supply chain procurement people are going to be watching this. And you've hit a low alarm now. So what do you do? Well, that could trigger a reorder. That could tr trigger a dispatch truck. But certainly it, it gives you some advance notice so that if it hits a critical low alarm, which you saw on the red line, then bam, trucks routed built into a route, high priority, and it's um, now been um, deployed for refill. And then the whole process starts again. A couple great things here that happen. This, is, uh, this becomes ultimately automated where the, the trigger points of these alarms are then going to um, create an action. And then that can create you know, a dispatch ticket, it can create uh, an invoice, it can create a reconciliation process. You have backup to show, yes, this happened on this date. It matches my bill. So it just takes care of a lot of problems that can happen on the back end if you don't have this kind of visibility or data. The other thing that we've noticed is a lot of customers want a lot of data. And until they kind of set the alarms and thresholds, um, you know, they sort of use a little too much data. And then once you're able to um, slowly ratchet those alerts and alarms or rate changes, then they compress and compress and you completely ratchet, ratchet the whole operation and the parameters down. So you get so efficient that, you know, you're operating with much, much less than you ever thought you could. So now let's look at what a dispatcher would see um, going through a list of um, tanks here. He's only filling or she's only filling the, the red and yellow tanks not stopping at the greens, not wasting time on that, no topping off. So that's great. 
Now let's say that that same truck and transport vehicle was in um, Tobaccoville of all places. I'm not sure why that's there. I guess there's a um, maybe a cigarette cigar company or something involved in this. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, dispatcher can say, "Hey, okay, you've got 20% left on the truck. Um, let's find out where else we can put it." So quickly lasso an area and highlight, notify the truck, hey, you know what? Why don't you take this um, low tank in Bologna, possibly the yellow one that was just off from Hideaway Lake, and then come in empty. So it's that kind of you know dynamic decision making um, that comes through that data visibility and data collection and you know integrated systems and, and bringing the more value to the solution. So one last thing is you've got sort of must do's, should do's and could do's. And you know, that's kind of the, the, the logic that we build into the system. So the must do's are done, but now I've still got some left. So let's go down to the should do's because they're coming up next. And then lastly, the could do, but not necessarily have to do. So that's kind of the logic tree for a dispatcher that's gonna use a system like Skybits to help drive that efficiency. And then this, this is really the more data analytics layer that I think is important to see because this can be sliced and diced, you know, six days a Sunday. And it's really giving you um, the overarching view of the business. And, you know, you can organize it into um, all types of things, but I'm just going to go through some of the ways we've done it for delivery efficiency here. You can see you've got um, different levels of efficiency and it's all over a period of time. But you can see where you're trending and, you know, whether you're below or you met or above and, um, and start to work against that um, and create, you know, better, um, better results. And then you can break this down to a regional market. So if you have regional operating centers or rocks and you want to measure against each other, create competitions, whatever it is, but you want to know how things are doing or how things are selling, you can go by product line, you know, and, and, you know, See, see how well that's working. You can do it by route, whatever you want. And then this, of course, would break it down by your critical load. So if I'm coming into the office and I want to see which, which is my priority for the day, I would say, okay, I want to do the critical lows and the lows, and then I can start to look at some of the others. But it helps you prioritize and see kind of a snapshot. It also kind of extrapolates into the whole supply chain value, value and that sort of link to upstream purchasing and um, you know, how to, you know, really start to plan your business uh, to support, you know, what your demand looks like. So demand obviously drives, you know, purchasing and, and more, um, 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 you know, uh, flooding of the, or more putting inventory into the supply chain to support your demand. And the last piece here is really on the lower left is really showing the, um, uh, routes and specifics and you can get usage and rate usage and changes and it goes down to the most granular level there uh, as well as you can have a map view so you can literally see where tanks are located and and if a dispatcher needs to talk to a driver about finding something then you know you can literally get down to that level to help support that so what is the value of uh, proposition for the iot tank monitoring solutions i mean ultimately it starts with that visibility so I know where everything is. I have that data. I know the tank levels and consumption. Then it goes to shareability. So I can share this information with um, my third parties, with my distributors, um, with my jobbers, with my fleet, with my you know sister company, you name it. And then it comes down to alertability. So going back to the alarms, efficiency, and fine tuning the business. Let me know when something's wrong. Don't make me go dig into the system to try to find something tell me when there's a problem and then I can take action and it's supported. Those decisions are supported. Um, actionability, routing, we talked about scheduling, routing, being able to do that must do, could do, would do example is just one example of things you can do to then take action, um, resolve an issue or you know make an efficient delivery or a more efficient route. And then lastly, uh, here profitability, which really gets translated throughout the whole process. And that goes back to the ROI slide that I showed in the very beginning. So we start with, and this is sort of a progressive trajectory, but when you are planning to begin, and this could be in any level, um, predominantly it's in downstream for us, you know, chemical and oil, gas, fuels and lubes, but 
as you even move into midstream and upstream, this type of ROI model is really what you want to see. So you first get at its most basic level, the stair step is initial ROI through visibility, through improved accuracy, and then you get threshold rules where we talked about critical lows, critical highs, could be, you know, super critical lows or a rate change, you know, and things that are going to drive decisions or create concern, you want to build those logical rules in there and then be able to make intelligent decisions. Lastly, fully integrated solutions. So automated processes, automatically generated dispatch trucks, generated in, uh, invoices, um, updates to the ERP. This is going to increase, you know, your ecosystem value and efficiency, improve those customer relationships and reduce the capital expenditures. So we'll take a look at, um, you know, a, a tough route here, um, just to give you a comparison. You've got, in this case, 27 stops. You delivered 4,000 gallons in that last scenario. And you drove, uh, I think, 142 miles. So double the miles, less delivery, and twice as many stops. Not good versus the green, which gives you a, a nice indicator of you're stopping at the right locations. You know what's happened. You can pivot, you can change. If this didn't come back empty, guess what? You can make another stop along the way. We showed you the lasso. So if you take this and you say, okay, one IT device is where this starts, it's true. And then you have one truck, one driver, one route. And then you can say, well, I'm gonna grow the business. I'm gonna buy a company or whatever. And you can start to say, this becomes a lot more than that. It can become hundreds, even of, if not thousands of, of trucks and routes and drivers. So just to show you kind of the, the implication here, it, it becomes pretty, um, pretty um, impactful pretty quickly. So um, wanted to kind of finish off with this quote. Um, uh, there's actually two quotes. I think uh, Deming, William Deming, the famous uh, business consultant, and, um, statistician, et cetera, who said, in God we trust, all others bring data. Um, I think that's kind of what, a, what the world is that we're in now. And, and we have to kind of, you know, start to adopt and embrace it uh, or get left behind. So, um, and I also think there's a connectivity piece to this. And, you know, I think learning that visibility, learning to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. That's really what's happening here. Um, it's data integration and it's uh, validation. And every day I'm seeing it, we're seeing it more and more. And um, yeah, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Or thank you, excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Anton. <laughs> thank um, you, Sam. Thank you. So any questions? Yeah, we've got some questions. Uh, okay, so the let's start with uh, what kind what kinds or how much hardware are needed for implementation? Um, so it depends on the application. We have um, it, it's really specific to the type of uh, you know inventory being managed. So lubes have a specific you know sensor um you know diesel fuel uh, all require kind of a different hardware but based on what you're trying to measure and manage is we we have the right fit and we have a full portfolio to support that um and uh so yeah it really depends on what you're trying to measure uh it's not a one size fits all i, I kind of wish it was it would make it a lot easier but um sensors are really you know, live and die by being, you know, applied to the right product that we, we support. Okay. Hope and actually, yeah. And yeah. For, yeah, if, if, if people need more information um, and yeah, we've got a lot of questions here. So obviously people do have a lot of questions. They can go okay. to uh, your stand and actually make an appointment with you or one of your colleagues through, oh, great. Yeah. through at the stand. So you can set a time awesome. in their calendars. Um, but let's uh, go to another one. Do you have water utility use cases? We do actually. We we do several, actually a lot in Arizona where we're doing um, a lot of water transport um, management solutions. So be happy to share some of those use cases with you. Okay, all right. Yep. Uh, another question. What processes do you have in place for fail safe data transmission if you're in remote areas? So um, if, if you're in a remote area and it really depends if it's a connectivity issue, um, that can sometimes resolve itself. Um, if it's a device issue, um, you know, that's something that could, could be a battery issue. 
Um, in which case, you know, the, the best thing is to get the, get the unit back online. Um, but uh, there is, you know, obviously data collection still happening and storing forward capabilities. Okay. Uh, how available is remote solar powered cell net reporting sensor packages? Um, it's coming uh, for, for us. Uh, you know, we have it on our roadmap. Um, certainly, you know, we have a lo very long battery life. So um, it's, it hasn't been as high of a priority until about a year ago, but we see the need to, to go that direction. So it's on our roadmap. I would say um, we're looking at probably mid, uh, probably Q2 of 2021. Okay. We'll have that availability. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're looking to start with tech monitoring, where do you start? Wow, good question. Um, I think the first, uh, the first piece is really scoping out what the operation looks like. Um, I think, you know, what, one thing that we offer is uh, a deployment team that helps project manage that. So the first step is really taking an inventory of all your tanks and knowing what's in them. And then from that point, you can, you know, come up with the right product mix. So as I mentioned earlier, you get the right um, device and the right product and then you can kind of then take it more as a, as a geographical approach or a customer-based approach. A um, couple ways to skin the cap, but really it's been coming up with a, with a deployment plan. And we offer that plan and that service. Um, we've done deployments of, you know, hundreds of units up to, you know, over 5,000 units for large, you know, um, North American rollouts for uh, pretty, in pretty short time frame. So we, we have the methodology and the expertise to do that. Um, in-house and, uh, and also third-party installers that we work with that can also help with the actual installation implementation process. Yep, right. Uh, and just a final question, can you describe the entire billing package for customers? So how that um, works? Uh, from, a, from a purchase standpoint, uh, like the different um, buying options or billing options? Well, I mean, they, they, he says, uh, Marcel says billing, the entire billing package. So I'm not sure how oh, you see. approach that. I, I think I would say, so we offer uh, a couple different uh, methods to buy. Um, one is a soft, you know, kind of a software as a service, um, a fully managed service solution. So you can pay a low monthly fee. And really it's if you want an OPEX versus a CAPEX solution. So you're OPEX is going to be, you know, a, a monthly fee um, for a full service solution. So we maintain ownership of the hardware, but we deploy it for you and monitor it. Um, and you, you're able to leverage that over the life of the term of the agreement um, versus a traditional, which is a, you know, you're buying the hardware and then you're paying a monthly fee. The difference really is probably a little higher on the service from a warranty standpoint, because we own the unit. Uh, while it's in the field on the managed service, but you're going to have a, a lower monthly fee um, uh, up front, but longer term, you know, you're going to have a higher monthly fee um, versus traditional where you're going to have a higher monthly up front, but then that becomes a, a lower monthly fee ongoing. Uh, yep. But our products are warranted. They last a long time. So it really just depends on where folks want to, to put, the, um, put the expense line, CapEx or OpEx. But we provide both. Okay. All right. So uh, that's it. Great, great presentation, Anton. A lot of, lot of good questions there. So a lot of interest um, in, in your presentation. So I encourage uh, everyone to go to uh, Skybits' uh, exhibition stand. There's a lot of information there, downloads, uh, and you can, you can make an appointment with Anton or one of his colleagues to go through it in more detail. Would love um, to. Thank you. The next...